Hi, welcome back on Stocker's Tip. So, in the last video, we talked about the stock price, ST. We modeled it with a drift and a volatility term, that is, geometric Brownian motion. But we didn't actually solve it. We didn't get something that says ST equals something. Let's do that now. We start by looking at the two parts of the model, the drift term and the volatility term. The drift is the easy piece, a classic differential equation. The problem is the red part, the volatility, because we can't solve differential equation directly when there's a Brownian motion term inside. First move, divide by st so all the st terms are on the left. Now, just to warm up, hide the red volatility term and keep only the drift. This is the clean, deterministic case. We expand using a Taylor series, first order and second order terms. In standard calculus, terms like dt squared and higher powers vanish, so only the first order term remains. Integrating in time then yield the familiar exponential growth. Now bring the red term back, the randomness. The simple trick isn't enough. We need to use what we call Ito's lemma. Let's start with a smooth function that depends only on time. We lay the first degree Taylor expansion line on top, then we add second degree, then third degree, and you see the approximation improve as the degree increases. But at the infinitesimal scale around t, first degree is enough. This can be mathematically translated into the fact that dt squared terms and higher are equal to zero. Of course, this is not a rigorous demonstration, but let's just say it is enough for now. Now, we change the setup. Let the function depend on time and also a Brownian motion. Let's zoom again. What you can see is that the straight line no longer captures the local behavior. And when we try different slopes, it still misses. So the first degree approximation we used before isn't enough anymore. We have to bring back the second order terms. One more change before writing the rule. Instead of raw Brownian motion, we switch to an Ito process. That just means that the Brownian motion is scaled by sigma and there's a drift term. Now we list all the pieces up to second degree. First, we can remove the dt squared term. Then the mixed term dt times dx shows up in purple. Then the dx squared term. Now let's look at the dt times dw terms. Remember, in the previous videos, we saw that the increment of Brownian motion over a small time step has mean zero. So the expectation of the difference in Brownian motion multiplied by the difference in time is zero in expectation, since the Brownian increment is independent of the past and has mean zero. So dt times dw is equal to zero. We also saw earlier that Brownian motion accumulates quadratic variation proportional to time. So dw times dw is also equal to dt. Of course, this isn't a full rigorous proof, but these are the rules we'll use moving forward. And now we have the Ito lemma completed. Back to geometric Brownian motion. We pick the function to be the logarithm and apply the Ito lemma we just saw. And here is the solution for the geometric Brownian motion. Okay, now let's talk about options. A simple way to understand options is to think of them like insurance. Basically, options are an insurance against unfavorable price moves. Let's say we own a stock worth 100 and we're worried it could fall to 80 or 60. That's our risk. So we can buy insurance, more precisely an option, that lets us still sell at 100 if the market drops. The 100 level is the strike price. We show it in red. When the stock goes below that red line, we can use the option to offset the loss. This strategy is called a long put. Long means we're the buyer of the option, the one getting the insurance. 
put means this option gives us the right to sell the stock at the strike price, no matter what will be the market price in the future, which is exactly what we want when we fear a drop. We can also flip the story. Suppose the stock is at 100 and we think it will go up, but we don't own the stock yet. What we can do is buying another option, which in this case is like insurance for the upside. This time, the option gives us the right to buy the stock at the strike price. Again, shown in red. If the market goes to 120, the option lets us still buy at 100, which means you could make a profit of 20. The yellow area on screen shows that gain. This is a long call. Long again because we buy the option, and call because it gives us the right to buy the stock in the future at a fixed strike price. Now let's look at the other side when we are not the one buying the option, but the one who is selling it, or issuing it if you prefer. That's called being short on the option. When we're short, we're like the insurer. We collect the option price now, but we take on the risk that the buyer may exercise the option later. On screen, we switch to a short call example. A call gives its buyer the right to buy, so the buyer benefits if the price rises. In our first short call path, the price eventually goes down. So at the end, big T, the buyer doesn't use the option because it's not worth it to exercise. We highlight one more important detail while we're here. There are different kinds of options, mainly the American and European options. American options can be used anytime up to the end. European options can be used only at expiration. In the yellow region, an American call holder could exercise, a European holder must wait. Here, if it's European, we're fine writing it because it's not worth anything at the end. Now, let's move to the next example. Here, by the end, the stock price has gone way up. The buyer will definitely use the call, and as the seller, we will have to deliver. So, we lose money on that short call at expiration. Let's pause and make the payoff picture visible on screen. At the end of the contract, a plain call is worth stock price minus the strike price, otherwise zero. That's what the vertical yellow segment at the final time is showing. So, we know what is the value of the option at the expiration date, but what about the value before? This is a more complex question, because we cannot just do the same simple equation. For instance, if at early time, the option may be out of the money, but maybe in the future, the underlying stock price will change. So we need to find a more advanced formula to take into account this stochastic behavior. To answer that, it helps to think from the seller's point of view. When we sell an option, we take on the risk that it may be used against us. We want to protect ourselves, to hedge, so that, no matter how the stock wiggles, our overall position doesn't suffer random hits. The idea is to build a replicating portfolio, hold some amount of the stock plus some cash, or a risk-free bond. Here's the intuition on screen. If the stock is moving up and we are short a call, we're exposed, so we buy some stock to compensate. If the stock isn't moving much, or the option isn't very sensitive to the stock right now, we don't need much stock. We can hold more cash and let it earn passive interest. The tricky part is deciding how much stock versus how much cash at each moment. And that's exactly what the Black-Scholes model will tell us. How much stock to hold, how much cash to hold, and therefore what the fair option price should be before expiration. So let's see the same thing through a more mathematical perspective. The portfolio that replicates the option holds an amount A of the stock, in red, and an amount B of cash, or a bond, in blue. Let's look at the dynamics of each piece. For the stock price S, we already know it follows geometric Brownian motion. It has a drift part and a random part. For the bond, or cash, there's no randomness at all. It just grows deterministically at a constant rate r. Knowing how both pieces move, 
we can describe how the whole portfolio moves, and by rearranging, we can separate its drift, the predictable part, from its diffusion, the random part. There's also another way to write the portfolio's dynamic with the Ito's lemma, exactly like we used earlier, so let's use it on the option value. Now we have two expressions for the portfolio's drift and diffusion, one from the stock plus bond view and one from Aito's lemma. Let's match them and solve for A and B. Let's start with A. We see that A, the number of shares we must hold, is proportional to how sensitive the option price is to the stock price. In precise terms, A equal the option's delta. So if a small move in the stock makes the option move a lot, we should hold more stock. If the option barely reacts to the stock, for example, when the call option is worthless because the stock price is well below the strike price, we don't need much stock. We can hold more cash instead. Then we isolate B as well. That's the cash or bond part that completes the hedge. Once we plug A and B back into the replicating portfolio, we get the pricing equation that the option value must satisfy. This is the Black-Scholes equation, a stochastic differential equation with a terminal condition that says, at the end, the option's value equals the payoff, which for a call is stock price minus strike price, if positive, otherwise zero. If we solve this equation, we won't do it here on screen, we get the Black-Scholes formula. It looks a bit scary at first, but the structure is clear. It has two normal cumulative distribution functions. We'll show them in yellow and blue. The number called D plus is slightly larger than D minus. Visually, think of sliding a bell curve left or right. When the stock price equals the strike, both D plus and D minus sit near the center. When the stock price drops, both slide left. When the stock price rises a lot, both slide far to the right, and their CDF values are 1. In this case, we say the option is deep in the money because you will definitely make a profit by exercising it. The call price simplifies to stock price minus the discounted strike. That matches our intuition. If the stock is way above the strike near the end, the option behaves like the stock minus the strike. The only extra detail is the discount factor. Because money today is worth more than money later, we discount the strike at the risk-free rate. Let's add one more visual to tie it together. On the left, we plot the stock price path. On the right, we plot the call price from the Black-Scholes formula for the same path. When the stock drops below the strike, the call becomes mostly worthless, especially near the end. So the option value goes towards zero as expiration approaches. In the middle of the path, if there's still time left, the option can keep some value because there's a chance the stock comes back up. But as time runs out and it's still below the strike, that chance disappears and the value fades. On the other hand, when the stock goes above the strike, the call value starts to look more and more like the difference between the stock and the discounted strike. Near expiration, if we're well above the strike, the options value and stock minus strike almost coincide, exactly the behavior we expect. All right, so now I'd like to present an alternative way to think about the portfolio hedging strategy. Here is the idea. If you're shorting an option, meaning you're selling it, or more precisely, you're the one who issued it, then there's a risk involved. If the option ends up being profitable to exercise at maturity, which is called being in the money, where you'll have to pay that amount to the person holding the option. So for you, this is a potential loss. You might need to spend money at the end, and we can think of this as a negative amount. Let's just call it minus C, with C being the option price. Now, to reduce or eliminate this risk. The idea is to build a portfolio that includes some amount of the underlying stock. Why? Because when the stock price goes up, the value of the option tend to go up too. They're linked. So, if you hold a certain amount of the stock, 
That movement in price can help cancel out the change in the option's value. So, in this alternative portfolio, we hold a certain quantity, let's call it delta, of the stock. That's our key idea, combining minus the option price with plus delta times the stock. The only question is, how much of the stock should we actually hold? What should this delta be? To find that out, we look at how this portfolio behaves as time moves forward. We look at small changes and break them down into two parts. One part that's predictable and depend on time, that's the drift. And another part that is random and unpredictable, that's the risk, which comes from the stock's volatility. What we want is to cancel out the random part, the risk. That's the whole point of hedging. We want a portfolio that's not exposed to that randomness anymore. So we try to find the right amount of stock, aka the right delta, that makes the risky part disappear. And when we solve for it, it turns out that the right delta is equal to how sensitive the option price is to changes in the stock price. In more technical terms, it's the derivative of the option price with respect to the stock price. But in simple terms, it's just a measure of how much the option price reacts when the stock moves. Let me show you two examples. In the first one, the option is definitely in the money. As we get closer to the expiry date, the option price moves almost one for one with the stock price. That means the option is very sensitive to the stock. So delta is high and you need to hold a lot of stock to hedge properly. In the graph, you can see the green line. That's the amount of stock we hold going up. And to buy that stock, we use cash, shown in purple. So the cash goes down. In this case, we're actually borrowing money to buy stock to get exposure, which is why the cash is negative. Now, in the second example, the option is out of the money. The stock price ends up well below the strike price, so the option becomes worthless. And when this happens, the option price barely reacts to the stock price at all. Its sensitivity drops close to zero. That means a delta is very low, and we don't need to hold much or any stock. You can see in the plot that the green line, the stock we hold, also drops to zero. And here's the most important part. If you look at the total value of the portfolio, the sum of everything we hold, it stays right around zero the whole time. That's the yellow line. Even though each individual piece, the option, the stock, and the cash, moves up and down, the whole portfolio stays flat. That shows our strategy is working. We started with risky assets, like the option and the stock. But by combining them in just the right way, we remove the risk completely. We're not making or losing money. We're just perfectly neutral. And that's what a delta hedge is all about, using the right mix of assets to cancel out risk. All right. Thank you for watching and see you in the next one.